And earlier today, one of the country's top cardiologists cemented his public U-turn on COVID vaccines by publishing a nine-month peer-reviewed study into the jab's efficacy and safety. Dr. Asim Malhotra, a global expert on health and disease, encouraged people to get vaccinated on national television in early 2021 and dismissed vaccine hesitancy as, quote, anti-vax propaganda. He was also one of the first people in the UK to be double jabbed. However, nearly two years on, Dr. Malhotra has now gone full circle with his study on mRNA-specific COVID vaccines in the Journal of Insulin Resistance, where he sits on the editorial board, which has been praised by the likes of Dr. Renee Hodenkamp and Dr. J. Bhattacharya. Amid a wave of increased excess deaths, myocarditis in youngsters and cardiovascular emergencies amongst people worldwide, Dr. Maholtra's reanalysis of randomised controlled trial data suggests a greater risk of suffering a serious adverse event from the COVID vaccine than the disease itself. He argues that the billions who took COVID jabs could not have possibly given informed consent because they were simply not made aware of the risks. And he says that while a case can be made that the vaccines may have saved some lives in the elderly or otherwise vulnerable group, that case seems, quote, tenuous at best in other sections of the population, including the fit, young and healthy. He is now calling for an immediate end to the global COVID vaccine program pending international independent investigation, including the release of raw trial data from vaccine makers Pfizer. So you call this, Dr. Mahotra, great to see you, by the way, you, you call this a pandemic of misinformation. What, what do you mean? Because obviously at the start, yeah. you were taken in by it. Yeah, so it's a good question, um, Dan. I think uh, to conclude from my own analysis, I think what we're dealing with now with, with hindsight is uh, perhaps the greatest miscarriage of medical science we will witness in our li lifetime. And the reason I say that is um, we were led to believe from the beginning, as you've already said, I was one of the first people to take the jab. Mm -hmm. I helped out in a vaccine center. I was on Good Morning Britain helping tackle vaccine hesitancy. Is we'd conflated this emergency use authorization vaccine with traditional vaccines, which I have to say have been one of modern medicine's greatest achievements, estimated to save four to five million lives a year. So you're not anti-vax? No, not at all. This is specifically awesome. about the Pfizer mRNA it jab? Is. It is. And over time, certainly in the last 18 months to two years, as the information has evolved, what I try to do is look at that data and break it down so that we can have more informed discussions with patients to work out what the benefit is for them versus the harms. And that analysis that I've done when you come to the benefits show that the efficacy is, let's put it this way, um, uh, extremely poor. In, certainly in relation to other vaccines. So if one looks at, we know, for example, now, Dan, that it doesn't prevent infection. So at the beginning, we were led to believe it's going to prevent infection, you're going to stop transmission, you're going to help save granny. We knew, you know, it didn't take long to figure out. In fact, more people seem to buzz it on once they've been jabbed. Yes, weird. absolutely. Well, interesting, it's not even that weird. It's interesting because there is some data suggest there is, certainly with recurrent boosters, mm. probably an immunosuppressive effect. Mm which you really couldn't make up. So a vaccine is causing an immunosuppressive effect. But, but breaking it down just in simple terms, if you are, for example, over 80, um, we looked at data from the, the whole Delta wave last year, mm -hmm. vaccinated versus unvaccinated. How many people do you need to vaccinate if you're over 80 to prevent a COVID death? And that was about 230. Mm -hmm. 70 to 80, 520. You look at Omicron, we're talking about 7,300 mm -hmm. now. That's not that great in terms of benefit. Now, if there were no side effects at all, you could say, fine, let's vaccinate as many people as possible and we will save some lives. The problem is this, reanalysis of the highest quality data that we have that led to the approval of the vaccine, Moderna and Pfizer trials, mRNA technology, mm -hmm. done recently, published in the peer-reviewed vaccine journal a few weeks ago, done by very eminent scientists, suggests a greater risk of a serious adverse event, life-changing, disability, hospitalization, than being hospitalized with COVID. That was from the original mm. trial. What we don't know is who does this affect more? Is it younger people or older people? Now, I've separately analyzed the risk of heart problems. I'm a cardiologist primarily, so my interest is in cardiovascular outcomes. One of the reasons I started looking at this data in more detail, Dan, is because my father, who's vice president of the BMA last July, suffered a sudden cardiac death. And I couldn't explain it. He was a very fit guy, 73 years old, you know, walking 15,000 steps during lockdown. Um, you know, th there was no reason. He considered one of the fittest people in his community. There's no family history of heart disease in, uh, in his family. So I ordered a post-mortem. 
And the post-mortem findings shocked me. He had two severe narrowings in his arteries, which didn't make sense. I knew his medical history, I knew his cardiac status, everything. I thought, okay, sometimes these things happen, but it didn't make sense to me. A few months later, several bits of data started to emerge that suggested that the actual COVID mRNA vaccines increased coronary inflammation. One from a whistleblower at a prestigious UK institution, which I talked about on GB News, and the other one was actually published research, which showed that what happens after you have the COVID vaccine within about two months, it increases your cardiovascular risk. Now, what else is going on in the real world? 2021 versus 2020, this is in my paper, we have 14,000 extra unexplained out-of-hospital cardiac arrests in this yep. country alone. Israel no data. No one wants to talk about Israel data, 16 to 39-year-olds, they did a very rigorous analysis, 25% increase in heart attacks and out-of-hospital cardiac arrests in 16 to 39-year-olds, specifically associated with, associated with the vaccine, not associated with COVID. And on that point, I think people need to be very wary of news reports coming out suggesting that COVID is suddenly causing heart problems. I don't buy it. And the reason I don't buy it is a lot of this stuff could be a deliberate PR machinery from pharma. This isn't conspiracy theories. During the whole tobacco campaign, Big Tobacco sponsored scientists and put out press releases and got in the news suggesting to divert the attention away that cigarettes were causing heart attacks, that it was down to stress. People who smoke are stressed, stress is a problem. We've seen this before. It doesn't have any plausible and it is um, isn't it, mechanism. That, that, that we are seeing very different rhetoric coming from the folk behind the Oxford AstraZeneca jab, which was, of course, a not for profit project, yeah. and the Pfizer and Moderna jab. Because if you listen to most of the folk behind Oxford AstraZeneca, they don't believe in these constant booster rollouts to the whole population. Yeah, it's interesting. The AstraZeneca one, you're right. Um, I mean, Pfizer have made $37 billion from mm. this product which is extraordinary. And Do you think <laughs> it, that it saved enough lives to justify the rollout in the first it's place? It's a great question, and we don't fully know the answer to that, and that's why we need the raw data, mm. because that will give us more definitive answers of yeah. what Pfizer knew at the time yeah. it was rolled out. But, Dan, what I would say is, even if it had an effect early on with the, the most mm. serious ancestral strain of the virus, the Wuhan strain, which mm. was devastating, yeah. and I've managed yeah, people yeah, with yeah. long COVID, no, what's circulating now, Dan, is essentially no worse than the flu. It's so a, we it's a shouldn't, if in your, your pause, opinion is yeah. that we shouldn't take up this role. If, if you're young and healthy, you shouldn't take up, because I got my text yeah. the, the other, yeah. the other so day. So did I. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be doing it. So did it, I. But, I'm not taking it. But it was very strongly but, worded yeah. that I should go and get my booster. There needs to be a proper informed discussion with patients. But what I would say is we need to ask people like Chris Whitty and the MHRA why, when we've got a serious adverse mm. event rate, which is probably in the range of at least 1 in 800 to 1 mm. in 1,000 from good quality data, why is it not being pulled when other vaccines, swine flu vaccine 1976 was pulled because it mm. caused Guillain-Barre syndrome in 1 in 100,000? Rotavirus vaccine was pulled in 1999 because it caused a form of bowel obstruction in 1 in 10,000. We're talking yeah. of serious adverse events of 1 in 800. Well, look, with Dr. Asim Mahotra, thank you so much, consultant cardiologist, author of today's new paper, of course. We did ask Pfizer for comment, by the way. They didn't get back to us.